So we're looking at the inverse hyperbolic functions. In the last video, we focused on the example of the uh, inverse for the hyperbolic sine function. And we saw that we can actually derive this nice identity, expressing it in terms of, I mean, it makes sense that we can get it in terms of logarithms, given that uh, the hyperbolic functions are defined using exponentials. And similar things work for cosine and, and tangent. You do have to be a little bit more careful with these, though, because remember that For the hyperbolic cosine function, we have a graph that looks something like this. This is certainly not perfect, but um, we, we, we get a graph that looks like this. Clearly not one to one, right? So when you're doing, so for the inverse, what we do is we take take our initial function to be hyperbolic cosine, but we're going to restrict the domain to be x bigger than or equal to 0, okay? Um, and so that means that when we, and, and of course the range, I mean the range is always, always, um, 1 to infinity here, right? Um, that minimum is at y is equal to 1, right? So that means that when we go to the hyperbolic cosine function, right, the domain here is the same as the range for the original one, so the domain has to be x bigger than or equal to 1. Makes sense, otherwise that square root's not defined. Yes, we could also have x, I mean, x less than 1 works here, but then it's not going to work here, right? Um, so x has to be bigger than or equal to 1 to make this work. And, and the range, well, the range is, is going to be that y is bigger than or equal to 0, right? Um, similarly, for the inverse of the hyperbolic tangent function, remember that the hyperbolic tangent function has these asymptotes at 1 and minus 1, right? So that means that the domain for the hyperbolic tangent function has to be, well, x has to be between minus 1 and 1, so in other words, the absolute value has to be smaller than 1, okay? Um, but then the, uh, the range for this will be the same as the domain for the hyperbolic tangent function, which is, well, everywhere. Okay. All right. So that's all well and good. Um, you can put these to use. We could try to derive these, but the, the approach for deriving some of these is kind of the same as what I did for, for hyperbolic sine function. Um, essentially, you, you'd let y equal to one of these. You play around. You invoke the definitions for these functions, and it's, it's algebra. It's algebra to get these expressions, right? To get the derivative, you can either take the derivative of the expression we have here in terms of a logarithm, and you can see that it works. Or you can use the approach that we used way back in chapter two for inverse trig functions, uh, essentially using implicit differentiation. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that you can do with this is you can go back and you can revisit some of the integrals that we did by trigonometric substitution um, not too long ago. Right? So you might recall that we, we looked at the following integral, okay? And we did this one using a secant substitution, and we got there, it worked out okay. Um, wasn't the most pleasant experience, but we got the job done. Now, an alternative is we can look, we can look here and we can look for that same pattern, and we find it here in the derivative for the hyperbolic um, cosine inverse, cosh inverse, if you like, okay? So what we might do is we might try something like this. We might say, okay, let's try letting x equal to one-half cosh t, okay? So then dx would be one-half sinh t, okay? And, and more to the point, 4x squared minus 1, 
becomes 4 times 1 over 4 cosh squared t minus 1. So cosh squared t minus 1. Okay. Um, but remember that cosh squared minus sinh squared gives you 1. So if you rearrange that, this is the same thing as sinh squared t. Okay. Very good. So that means that for the square root of 4x squared minus 1, we can take sinh t. Uh, I guess we should be a little bit careful here. Properly speaking, absolute value, um, because sinh can be negative. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll fudge that. We'll ignore the absolute value, and if we, if we need it, we'll put it in. Um, so what you would get then is you get, this will be um, simply sinh t. Okay. dx is now 1 half sinh t dt. So we get 1 half sinh squared t dt. Okay. But there's a half angle formula or a power reduction formula we can use for that. This is the same thing now as 1 over 4 times cosh 2t minus 1. Okay. So we get 1 over 8 sinh 2t minus 1 over 4 t plus c. Now we gotta we gotta convert back, right? Uh, actually, we don't actually need to worry about the absolute value. Why don't we need to worry about the absolute value? Well, because t t is defined to be right. So this is truly the substitution we're making. We're using cosh inverse of 2t. That's the substitution that we're making. Um, and we saw over here that if we're working with inverse hyperbolic cosine, right, domain, the range for that is y, y should be positive, right? Um, so t is positive, so sinh t is positive, so I, I can drop the absolute value. Signs take care of themselves in, in this one, okay? Good. Um, now, of course, we're going to need that here, right? Uh, we also probably want to worry about how do we how do we do that. But remember, we have an identity for that. Um, this is going to be one over four sinh t cosh t minus one over four t plus c. And now we can say, okay, well, cosh t is two x, right? Uh, what is sinh t? Oh, it's here, right? So this becomes, okay. So this is going to become, so that's, there's a two, still a one half. So one half x root four x squared minus one, minus one quarter t. Well, t is this, but um, we might prefer to actually write that in terms of that. So we can do that. We get the natural log of 2x plus the square root of 4x squared minus 1 plus c. Okay? So we can get our answer that way. Um, Yes, you could have done that. You could have done the secant substitution. You'd still get there. You'd still get the result. This is possibly a little bit cleaner. 